Uh, so we are in uh, week two of a two-week series on community. Ross uh, kicked things off last week on uh, doing life together and the importance of, of groups. And if you haven't heard that, if you missed it, I encourage you to go on our website. You can watch it. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good message. And so today we're, we're going to finish that, that community series. And uh, next week we, we kick off our um, road to, to Easter. We're, we're uh, going towards Easter. And uh, Chris Jones, our youth minister, is actually going to kick off that series. And then after that, then our pastor will take us four Sundays straight in, into Easter. So you'll want to be here for that and be a part of that. And there's lots of resources, easter.fbcallen.org. I'll, I'll share a little bit later on about that in announcement time, but that's something you want to be a part of. So don't be a jerk. That's the sermon. Goodbye. No, uh, last, in the last service, uh, some of you uh, know Jerry Williams. And as I was walking in, he goes, hey, Jimmy, do you need me to go up on stage with you? And I was like, what? I was like, what? He goes, well, just to be your, your example <laughs> of a jerk. I said, no, Jerry, I'll just call on you from the front, from the front. And uh, anyway, so uh, my family and I, we had the opportunity last year, January 1st, 2016, we were in Pasadena, California for the Rose Parade. Uh, I would have rather been there for the Rose Bowl, but we were there for the Rose Parade. Um, our son was a senior at Allen High School, and he was in the marching band. He was, he was in the, on the drum line, and so their band got invited to be a part of the Rose Parade. And so um, my wife and I and, and Catherine and Logan, we joined several other hundred uh, families and friends uh, from Allen, and we made the trek down to, uh, to Pasadena and did a lot, of, a lot of fun stuff. I was more excited about going to Disneyland, but the Rose Parade was kind of a bucket list for, for my wife. So we went, we, uh, and we were a part of it. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen the Rose Parade uh, on TV. We, we used to watch it. It was kind of always just a tradition. You'd watch it for a little while. For me, it was more kind of a filler until the college football game started. So the parade was on for a little while. But when you see it on TV, it, it's pretty spectacular, right? Because there's the, the grandstands on both sides of the street. They're completely filled. There's, there's cameras, there's news reporters, and they're talking all about stuff. And the floats are kind of coming by, and they stop, and they do a performance right there in front of the, from the TV camera. And it's just a really, really cool scene. So when, when you see something on TV, and then you go to it, you kind of have this expectation of what it's going to look like. But what you don't know when you, when you see it on TV is that first initial part is just, it's just a few hundred yards where there's all that, that big time hoopla and everything's going great. Then, then they make this the turn, this right turn, and they go down the street. And then the rest of it is just kind of a, just a regular old parade route. I mean, my view, we were in a grandstand uh, full of people, uh, mostly all Allen people who'd come with the band, and, and we were packed in there tight. And so, um, I mean, it was, it was tight. We were kind of like sardines. The, the lady who was sitting in front of me, her head was here, the whole parade. Um, that's how tight we, we were. We, we got to know each other pretty well. Um, but, but we got there, and, and you have this expectation, and they, you go up to your, you, to your grandstand, to your seats, and I sit down, and I look across for me, and I see a 7-Eleven, and uh, that just really wasn't, it wasn't what I was expecting. And, and then anyway, and so and the parade starts, and, and this thing is six, seven miles long, and so I'm getting calls or, or texts from family members who said, hey, I saw the band on TV, that must have been awesome. And I'm like, they're still like an hour away until they get to where we are. We haven't seen anything. The only thing I'm looking at is a 7-Eleven and, and some other people sitting on the side of the curb, because uh, it's just like, so it wasn't as... as is, you know, cool as I thought it was going to be because it's not what I saw on TV. But anyway, so you're sitting there, you get there, you have to get there super early, uh, you get in your seats. And, and so we have, I mean, we probably sat probably an hour, maybe a couple hours. I can't really remember. So we're kind of a captive audience. So there are different people walking around doing different stuff. Then along comes this one guy and um, he starts, he starts in and he's got a, he's got a megaphone and guess what he starts doing. He starts preaching. He starts preaching to the crowd and talking about, you know, talking about God and God is love. And, and, he, and he started going really good for a little while. But then you could tell, and, and anytime I see someone like this, I, I get a little bit nervous and I start to cringe a little bit. Well, it, it, he went from the loving message to the, you're, this, you know, you're going to hell and this is not good. And, and it just immediately, it just immediately turned bad. And everyone started to kind of shut him down. 
Now, some of you might be going, well, you know, California people, they don't love God. Well, this was in front of a grandstand full of Allen Texan people, Bible Belt people, and, 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 we just, and it just, it got bad. And then he started arguing with people, and they were, tra- and so it was just, I wanted to stand up and go, yo, bro, do, do all of us Christ followers a favor and stop. Stop, because what you're doing is, is not helping. And eventually he, he started getting booed and they had to, he wasn't doing anything illegal. He was just being annoying and the police just kind of asked him to move on. And when he left, everyone clapped. And then you just kind of started to hear the chatter. And I thought, man, I don't, know, I don't know if he was successful anywhere else, but that dude did a ton of damage for the cause of Christ right there. And you know why? Because this isn't loving. This isn't loving. This isn't what, this doesn't build bridges. This isn't about relationship. This is more about, let me tell you everything that's wrong with you. And let me tell you everything that's right with what I've got. It's just kind of the turn or burn, go to hell or go to Jesus or, you know, you're bad and here's why. And, that, and that's what people hear. And that's what a lot of people think about Christians. That's the message that they hear. That's, 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 what, they're, that's what they're focused on. And, and it's my opinion that, that more and more people turn away from Jesus, not because of Jesus, but because of his followers. They don't want anything to do with Jesus because they don't want anything to do with, with us. And, and this, this isn't a message of love or of hope or forgiveness. It's a message of hate, of condemnation. It's a message that repulses people. Now, I'm I'm not accusing all of you of going around with a megaphone. Some of you may have one, and, and, and that's great. But, but some of us, by the way that we act, our actions scream, scream a different message other than the message of what Jesus wants us to, to have and the message that Jesus wants us to say. And so I believe that a lot of people are being turned off from Jesus by the people who claim to be Jesus' followers. Now, if you have your Bible, I want you to turn into John, John chapter 13. You may already be there, but John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. And this is going to be kind of where we launch today for, for the rest of our time together. John's in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's one of the four Gospels, one of the four biographies of Jesus. And it says this in John 13, 34 and 35. It says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now, Jesus, when he's talking here, he's talking to his his 11 disciples. There were 12, but one of them, Judas, uh, has already left. He went to go and betray Jesus. So there's there's 11 of them there. And there may have been just a, a few more of his followers, but not many. But we know for sure his 11 were there with him. And he had just washed their feet. He just shared his final meal with them. He's on his way to the cross. These are these are his some of his final words to his disciples before that he's crucified. And what he says is, he says, "A new commandment I give to you, that you are to love one another." Now, the new that wasn't new. Love wasn't new to the disciples. They probably grew up in families that that maybe loved them. They probably heard the term "I love you." They knew what it means to to treat each other nice. They, they knew what it means when someone loves you, you love them back. They, they got that. They understood that. That wasn't the new part. But what was new was how, how Jesus told them to love. And did you catch it? He said, just as I loved you, you are also to love one another. And that, that changed everything. The disciples knew, they, they knew how to be nice, but did they know how to love? But more in particular, did they know how to love the way that Jesus loved? Did they know how to to model, to to do what he had been modeling for them? And it took it to a whole other level. This this kind of raised the bar. It wasn't just love that that everyone knew. This was a different type of love. And you know why? Jesus said this way. Why do we love the way that Jesus loved? Because it says it there in verse 35. He says, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples. By this, this is, this is, he's talking about <clears throat> how they're going to be identified, how they will be known that, that are on Jesus' team. This is the good thing that's going to distinguish them from everyone else. They're going to be followers of Christ. They are followers of Jesus. And this is how people will know that they were followers of Jesus. There were lots of disciples out in the world, in this world that we're talking about here in, in Scripture. Because there were lots of rabbis, lots of teachers, and they all had people who were following them. But Jesus said, this is, this is how they're going to know you're with me. This is, this is how they're going to know that you're on Jesus' team, that this is the uniform that you're wearing. This is going to be the mark that separates you from all others. By this, 
all people will know that you are my disciples if you have what? Well, if you, if you have a bumper sticker on your car that says Jesus or, or cross or fish, that's how you'll know you're, you know. Or maybe, maybe a, a, a cool t-shirt. Yeah, a, a cool t-shirt that says Jesus, you know, is the reason for the season or something like that, you know, or no. Maybe, maybe a Facebook post. I'll, I'll put it on my Facebook, on, on my profile that, that I, I love Jesus or, or I'll post one of those things that says Jesus, you know, Jesus is Lord of all and if you believe this, share this with all the people that follow you and if you don't do this, then you're, you know, you're not a real Christian or, or whatever. No, it's, it's, it's not that either. Or maybe it's an email forward. I'll forward this to, to my entire inbox and, and, and all, all, however many hundreds of people that I know, and most of this will go into their junk file, but I'm going to forward it anyway because that's how they'll know that I love Jesus is because I'm going to send them this, this really funny uh, Jesus cartoon email. No. Maybe a blog. I'll write a blog. That's how they'll know that I love Jesus. No. Oh, maybe an argument. I'll learn, how to, I'll learn how to argue. I'll really be good at, at, at apologetics and, 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 and I'll win every debate. That, that, that will show them that I love Jesus. No. He said the disciples' distinguish, distinguishing mark would be their love, their love for one another. Remember, there's, there's just a few people in this room, and he's telling them how they treat each other is going to let others know that they belong to him, and not just any love. Jesus said, the way that I loved you. We're called to live like Jesus. We're called to, to love like Jesus. So my question is, and this is in your outline, what are we known for? And when I say we, I'm not talking about all the Christians in the world, but I'm talking about us right here in this church, FBC Allen. What are we known for? And there's two words I want to share with you. The first one is this, selflessness or selfishness. What are we known for? You see, God wants us to be bridge builders to him. In other words, there's, there's people who don't know Jesus, and, and what he wants us to do is he wants to help us help them go from not knowing him to being in relationship with him, to knowing him. And we're supposed to be, that, that's God's plan. Believe it or not, boys and girls, men and women, that's God's plan is to use us to be bridge builders from being lost to being found. We do that by loving and Jesus says we do that, we're identified as bridge builders, we're identified as his followers by loving each other well and loving the people outside of these walls. By the word selflessness, you can write this word, I want you to write the word bridge. Being selfless means that you're a bridge. You're a bridge for others to, to Christ. And by the word selfish, selfishness, you can write the word jerk. That's what we don't want to be. We don't want to be known as a selfish church. We want to be known as a selfless church. So if, if we want to be known for our love, what's that, what's that going to take? What's that going to look like? It's going to take, as Jesus described it, it's a new commandment, a new type of love. I want to tell you a new way to love one another. And there's, there's four characteristics of this love that I want to share with you this morning, and we'll try to go through these quickly. The first one is this. A new type of love is going to be a sacrificial. It's going to be a sacrificial love. First John, all of us know John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the gospel, by the way. Okay, but how about 1 John 3, 16? It says, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. You see, love costs us. It costs us something. It costs us our time. It costs us our comfort. It costs us treasures. It means that, that when we love one another as Christ loved that means that we're going to have to make sacrifices. He laid down his life for us, and so that, that cost him everything. So it, it stands to reason that if we're going to love the way that Jesus loved, if we're going to love each other that way, then guess what? It's going to cost us something. We're going to, we're going to have to make sacrifices. And the definition for sacrifice is it's the denial of self for another's gain. Wouldn't that be a cool thing to be known for at First Baptist Church, Allen? You know what? That's a bunch of people in that place who don't really, don't really focus on themselves, but they're really focused on other people and wanting people to get ahead. When you walk into church and you're saying, how can I invest in others? That's, that's what that means. You're, you're, you're willing to sacrifice. You're willing to do whatever it takes so that, so that people will know that they're loved, so that we can love one another, so people are encouraged. 
And that's the absolute opposite of walking into church and going, what's in it for me? What's in it for me? First Peter um, 4.10 says, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. You see, all believers, all Christ followers, all of us are capable of serving or ministering to other people. We're all, we've all been gifted by the Holy Spirit. If we are a believer in Christ, if we, cry, we call Jesus Christ our Savior and our Lord, then the Bible says that we have all been gifted. We have different types of gifts, but we're all capable of serving and ministering to one another. But I know what some of, some of you think, well, Jimmy, I come to church, I, I, I come to, 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 to get for me, to soak in, because I've, I've been out in the world all, all day, all week long, and I, and I want to get away from that. I want to come here, and, and, and this is about me, this is about my time, this is my church. But for those of you that would say that, I, I would say this, when you, when you are ministering to people, almost 100% of the time, you get ministered to. Ask people. Ask people, ask the people around you who, who've been involved in ministry, who teach a Bible study or, or who greet people at the door or, or who are part of our prayer team or who do any kind of ministry here. Ask them. Most of them will say to you, I went in there to help. I went in there to minister. But you know what? I was ministered to. I went in there to be, to be a blessing to someone, but I was blessed instead. That's scriptural. Proverbs eleven twenty five 25 says, and this is not in your outline, generous persons will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. You see, when you're willing to minister, when you're willing to serve, when you're willing to love like Jesus loves, guess what? You're going to be ministered to. You're going to be loved. You're going to be taken care of. You will be refreshed. And so loving one another means that we're, it's going to take sacrifice. Matthew 20, 28 says, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus, King of kings, Lord of lords, creator of the universe, Son of God, Holy of holies, Jesus had every right to be served. He had every right to expect to be served. He was worthy. But he didn't serve, didn't come to be served, but instead he humbled himself. The Bible, uh, Matthew 28, 20, 28 says that there was, he ransomed. The ransom, that's, that talks about in, in the Greek, in that particular context, the word ransom means the price that you pay in order to free a slave, to, to pull them out of slavery. That's the ransom that you paid. And you think about that. Jesus ransomed us out from slavery, the slavery of sin, so that we can be free to enjoy life with him, life everlasting. So if Jesus ransomed himself, guess what? We're going to have to be willing to pay a price in order to love one another. We're going to have to make sacrifices. And it says he, he was a ransom for many. And that word many, in the Greek context, it's not, it's not necessarily talking about a specific number. It's talking about the, the effect of the ransom. So, you know, you drop a, you drop a rock into a, a stream or, or a lake or a pond, and there's this, this ripple effect. And that's what that, what that ransom for many, it was, it's talking about the impact that Jesus made by his service, by his love. And that's, that's what's going to happen to us, and, and that's what will happen through us if we're, willing to be, if we're willing to love as Jesus loved, if we're willing to sacrifice our time, our comfort, our calendars, if we're willing to sacrifice our agendas and say, I want to love one another as God told us to love one another. And the effect of that, the effect of that will go far beyond anything that we could ever think of or imagine. I did a funeral this past week for uh, uh, one of the ladies in our church, and one of the things that was talked about um, about her was, was her service, her willingness to serve, her willingness to, to care for one and for others, to love, to love others. Her, her daughter described her as very much a behind-the-scenes person, and it wasn't, it wasn't to receive glory, it wasn't to receive honor, it wasn't to even receive any kind of payment or, or, or something to come back to her. It was just who she was. It was a part of her DNA that she wanted to do what God told her to do, so she was just willing to serve. She was just willing to give. And think about that. Would you want to be with someone who's self-absorbed, who thinks about themselves all of the time, who has no consideration for anybody else, who talks about themselves, who, who cares more about themselves, and who's just trying to do their own thing all the time? Would you want to be a part of that? Most of you, I hope, would say no. Why? Because that's, 
that's not attract. That's the opposite of attractive. That's that's repelling. That's repulsive. That's 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 this. And no one wants to listen to this. What people want is people want someone who's going to love them and someone who's willing to do things for them, who's, who's willing to sacrifice for them because that's, that's who we are as a community. If we're going to love one another as Christ loved, then we've got to be willing to make sacrifices. Second thing there, the new type of love, it's messy. This, is, this can get messy. Let me, let me explain. Anytime you get involved with another person in, in, in a relationship, when you start doing life together, it, it's going to get messy sometimes. Loving one another means getting to know one another. Getting to know one another. Proverbs 14.4, I love this verse. It says, an empty stable stays clean, but there is no income from an empty stable. If we, if we, as First Baptist Allen, if we just wanted to keep things nice and neat, we didn't want to have any problems, we didn't want to have any conflict, we didn't want to, we didn't want to do any, we just, we just wanted to come in here, sit down, listen to worship, do worship, whatever, we just want to sit here, go, and then get out of here, then what we need to do is we need to make sure that we don't talk to one another. Don't talk to each other. We don't need to get involved with one another. We don't need to help one another. We don't need to serve one another. We just need to keep to ourselves. If we can keep to ourselves, then guess what? Our stable will always be clean. It will always be clean. But that's not love. There's some people that would would like to be that way. Some people would love to just keep their head down, don't look up, because I may have to interact with someone. That's not love. Love means loving even when it's inconvenient. Love means loving when it's uncomfortable. Love means loving even when it requires work. The verse says that that an empty stable stays clean. But when you bring an animal in it, what happens? It gets messy. But the animal, the mess is a part of, uh, of it all. Because if you don't have the animal, you don't have the income. You don't have what you need in order to do life. And when we come together as community, when we come together and we love one another the way that God called us to love one another, then guess what? It's going to get messy because we start to learn about one another and we start to know about one another. Our hearts, our hearts become open to each other. And it's going to get messy. We can be a clean church. Quote, unquote, clean church. But no one will want to be here or no one will want to stay here because no one is willing to do the work to love and care for one another. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 says, Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous, it does not brag, and it is not proud. And I want you to look at that last phrase, that love is not proud. And when you say pride or proud there, that's not, that's not a good thing. Like, ooh, I'm so proud of you. Uh, you know, I just have a lot of pride for you. No, nope, that's not that one. This is the type of pride or proud where, where you don't let anyone in. You take your heart, you close your heart, you lock the door, and you throw away the key. You don't want anyone in. Now, I realize that some of you in this room may say, hey, I've let people in before, and I've gotten burned. And for that, I apologize. That's, that's because we live in a broken world. But, but proud says that, that I'm, I'm not going to let you in. This type of, of proud uh, means that, that you think that there's really, there's nothing wrong with, with me. It's, it's just all of you guys. You guys have problems. Love gets messy. The type of love that Jesus is talking about, it gets messy because it requires transparency. It requires us, uh, us, us to, be, to be open it requires us to, to be willing to share our lives with one another. And here's what I want to be true of our church. I think it's true, but, but I may be wrong. But here's what, what I want to be true of our church. That it's okay to not be okay here at FBC Allen. I want that to be true of here. It's okay to not be okay here at First Baptist Church, Allen. Now, we don't, we don't want to leave you there. We don't, we don't want to leave you not okay. We want to help help you get to where God wants you to be and, and to experience the restoration and the healing and the saving grace of Jesus Christ. We, we, want, we don't want to leave you there, but we also understand that it's okay. You don't have to get your act together. You don't have to clean things up before you get here because remember, we said loving one another means it's going to get messy. And we're okay with that mess. It's okay to let others know that you're not perfect. 
You might get judged, and that's, that's a risk. That's a risk. But the ones that judge you are the jerks, just to be honest. But when you open up your life and someone judges you and ridicules you and mocks you, that's not love. That's being a jerk. And that's not from God. But more than likely, what you will find here, hopefully what you'll find here is when you open up, you'll find people identifying with you and with your story. You see, um, there's a good chance that if, if, you, if you get to know one another in this church, there's a good chance that in here, you're going to hear maybe a couple or a husband or wife say, you know what, our, our marriage, it isn't perfect right now. It isn't as strong as, as it used to be. Or, or we're kind of struggling. And it's okay to say that. You know why? Because we're not perfect. In here, in this church, if you talk to, to somebody, you might hear someone, you might hear this testimony that, man, I, I stink at being a mom or being a dad. I struggle. I want to be better, but I have such a hard time. That's okay. That's, that's, a part of, that's a part of not being perfect. You might hear someone say, you know what, I've, I've, got, I've got an addiction. I've got a problem. I've got a problem with alcohol. I've got a problem with pornography. I've got a pro- I work too much. I've got a problem with food. I've got a problem with whatever. You're going to hear that if you talk to people here in this church. Someone might say, I let work always get in the way of my family. I always let work take priority over my family, over my marriage, over my kids. You might hear that. You might hear someone say, I struggle with anger. Anger is always my first emotion. It's what I always go to. You might hear someone say, I am selfish. You might hear someone say, I don't like myself. You might hear someone say, I'm lonely. You might hear someone say, I feel like giving up. And when you hear those things, I know that there's probably a lot of people who would say, you know what? That's my story too. I feel exactly what you feel, or I felt exactly how you feel. But here's the thing. We don't know those stories if we're not willing to tell them. We don't need proud people. What we need, we just need honest people. Responding to one another in, in love. Because we know we all have a messy life. I've said it before up here many times. Sometimes I feel like I wish we just wore name tags, big name tags. It didn't have our name on it, but just had whatever our mess was. <laughs> I'm, I'm overworked today, or I'm, I'm stressed today, or, or you know, I'm lonely, or I'm, I'm feeling anxious, or I, I'm, I'm in up, I'm in up to it in debt, or our marriage is, we're just not connecting right now, or I'm, I'm lost, whatever it is, because I think there would almost be this, this kind of, I could just take a deep breath, because I know when I walk in here, I'm walking into a big mess, not just me by myself, my own mess, but I'm walking into a bunch of mess, and it's okay, and we're going to work together to be better. We're going to work to be what God wants us to be. But we're not judging one another because you go, look, hey, (laughs) there's someone who's got the same mess I do. But we don't know those stories unless we're willing to tell them. Galatians 5, 22, 23 says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. What What a list. What a list. Oh, could that be true of our church? You want to know why I think love is listed first? Just my opinion. Because the Bible says that God is love. And then that list of faith, hope, and love, the greatest of these is what? Love. Yeah. Love means getting messy. Jesus Jesus got messy right before he had dinner with these guys. In, In John chapter 13, he washed the disciples' feet. That wasn't just a disgusting job that he did, and it was, but it was more about teaching his disciples, teaching them a lesson about love, teaching them a lesson about service to say, listen, you need to serve one another like I've served you. You need to do what what I've modeled here. Jesus ate with sinners. 
Jesus got with people who, who didn't think like him, who, who, matter of fact, disagreed with him, but he went to them. and He, he, he had dinner. He, he'd socialize with these people. Well, everyone else looked at him and go, what is he doing? But Jesus says, listen, who needs a doctor? The person who's healthy or the person who's struggling? Jesus says, I'm going to go to the people who are struggling, not to the ones who think they're healthy, not to the ones who think they've got it all, not to the proud. I'm not going to the proud. I'm going to the ones who, who, who need me. That's where I'm going to go. Jesus gave, he, he spent time with, with, with women who were not living a life that they should have. Women who were caught in adultery. Women who, who weren't doing what God called them to do. And, and on top of that, they were not only women who, who weren't living like they should. They were in, in Bible times, being a woman already set you back. So you didn't, talk, you didn't talk to, much less talk to a woman who was a sinner. But you know what Jesus did? Jesus walked right up to those ladies and he gave them value. He gave them hope. He gave them purpose. He loved them. And guess what? All of those things that he did, they did not make him popular. They did not make him popular. Those things that he did, it was messy. They were messy. But what I love about Jesus, and when he did those things, he said, he said this to you and he said this to me, that none of these things are beneath me. And so they better not be beneath you. You better... Be willing to love like I love. In other words, you better be willing to get messy. Because people see that. They notice that. Number three, different kind of love. is unity. This is what it looks like. It looks like unity. Our kids, all of our kids have played sports throughout their uh, kidhood, <laughs> childhood, whatever you want to say. They, they've all played sports. They play different sports, soccer, baseball, football, lacrosse, basketball, tennis, golf. One of the hardest things to do as a parent uh, when watching your kid do the sport or activity that they're doing, one of the hardest things to do is to be quiet, right? You're in the stands, and it's, it's something inside of you. I think it's, it's God put it there, um, as, and, and so you, it wells up inside of you, and you see your child doing something that you think that they should be doing differently, or it's not correct in your own eyes, and it comes out, and you, you yell it to your kids. Now, I, I've been guilty of that sometimes, and I've gotten this look where my, my, mostly my boys, where they're doing whatever it is they're doing, and they stop, and they look at me, and then I know, okay, dad's gone a little too far. So I just, but, but we do that. Why? Because we think we, we, we know better, or at least we think that we know better. But meanwhile, there's a coach on the other side who's been coaching them and who's yelling one thing like, hey, you know, Tyler, go right. And I'm up in the stands going, Tyler, go left. Or, you know, or guard them. And he's saying, get back, you know, or whatever it is. And, and those messages, they, they get confusing. Matter of fact, our, our daughter, Catherine, her soccer team, they have a rule for the parents. It's something that we sign it says that we are, we are only to, sh to yell encouraging things to the players. We're not supposed to coach them. So well, I do things like, shoot it because I love you, you know, something like that. <laughs> I just, I, I, want to encourage, I want to encourage her as I'm coaching her. But it's this, it's this, it's this idea that, you know what, you, you can't have two, two voices yelling at you two different things. It's, it's confusing. Different messages are confusing and, and they're frustrating. And usually different messages come from conflicting agendas. And different agendas can destroy an organization. Different agendas can destroy a company. They can destroy a marriage. They can destroy a relationship. And guess what? Different agendas can destroy a church. There's power in unity. When Jesus said, I, I want you to love the way that I live, unity means that I care more about the overall goal than I do about furthering my own agenda. Jesus told us, listen, you have to die to yourself, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. So that means that we are going to love whatever it is that Jesus loved, whatever it is that he was about. That's going to be our main thing. That's going to be our number one thing. We're not going to try to further our own agenda. Churches get bogged down in opinions. Instead of unifying around, in, in different agendas, instead of unifying around the mission of the church. And I want you to know this, people notice. And, and I want to say something right here. For those of you that are guests, our, our church is not in any kind of conflict right now. We're, we're not about to split. I'm, I'm not saying this because, you know, this half are the Hatfields and this half are the McCoys. And you're set, you said, you better watch out. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that because I just, I just want to remind us of Jesus' command to love one another the way that he loved us. 
And part of doing what Jesus called us to do is to be unified in focus, unified in our agendas. And here, let me tell you this, in case you don't know this. You want to know who we are as a church and what we're about as, as, at FBC Allen? And you can write this down. We're recklessly, okay, r- I'm not recklessly, that's dumb, radically devoted to Christ, radically devoted to Christ, irrevocably committed to one another, and relentlessly dedicated to sharing the gospel with a lost world. That's what we are. That's our mission. That's our vision. That's our focus as a church. That's who we want to be. And what we want to make sure is we don't do anything that distracts us as a church from that. We don't want any competing agendas. We don't want any, anything else. We just want to say, listen, we are unified in this purpose, and we want the world to know who we are and how, and how we are devoted to God. We're devoted to one another, and we're devoted to sharing His gospel with the whole world, with a lost world. Philippians 2.2 2 says, fulfill my joy by thinking the same way, having the same love, sharing the same feelings, focusing on one goal. Do nothing out of rivalry or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourself. You see, Paul is urging the Philippian church, he's saying, listen, it's going to be easy for you to get distracted, and probably some of them already were within, within their congregation to get distracted to, to, to pursue other agendas. But what he's saying is this, pay attention, do the same thing, don't get distracted. And notice how he tells them to stay unified. He tells them to stay unified by being humble. In other words, remind yourself that this world is bigger than you and your agenda. That this church is bigger than you and your agenda. If you want to you kill unity, then allow your team, allow your family... Allow your company, your organization, or your church to think only about the individual. You'll destroy unity. Why? Because no one's working for the same goal anymore. What you're working for is what you want. And God says, listen, if you're going to love the way that I love, then you need to make sure that you prioritize what I prioritize. And I prioritize loving God. That's what he did. He prioritized loving one another, caring for one another, and he prioritized sharing the gospel. And as a church, that's what we need to be about. My family and I, we toured um, the Star. Any of you ever been to the Star in Frisco? Dallas Cowboys, New World Headquarters. It's kind of, I've been a Cowboy fan my whole life, so this was, this was kind of a religious experience for me. You know, I, I followed the Star, and it led me to Frisco, and I got there. And, and I bow down to the Dallas Cowboys. No, I'm just kidding. But this, this, was, this was amazing to me. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of incredible things. And, and it was fun to see and a lot of history. We even got to see some of the players. We, saw, we got to see Jason Witten. Uh, he was in the, in the weight room. And he didn't see us, but, but I was, we were on the other side of the glass. And he was just really just sitting there, really not doing anything, uh, just talking to guys. But, I mean, it was, it was like I was at an aquarium. I just had my face planted up against a glass, and I was just watching him. I was just amazed because he's, he's probably my favorite Dallas Cowboy. Um, and, and, and so it was, it was just really cool. And so I'm watching him and, and anyway, and so, but you, you can't just stay there and uh, ogle at them. You, you have to go with your tour group. And so we, we got to see a lot, of, a lot of great stuff. And we went into the room where they, um, their, their film room, it's actually, it's this ginormous theater. It's, it's got this huge movie screen, and then it's, it's got this kind of amphitheater, not amphitheater, but theater goes all the way up really high. It's 150, I think it's 150 seats, leather cushion, black leather cushion seats, and has desks, okay, they can ride on. But this is where they, where they watch film and, and where they break down their opponents. They even record their practices and watch their practices. They've got cameras going. They also said they have two uh, uh, drones that are going over the practice so they can look. They're doing all kinds of stuff, but they watch this film. As they're getting ready to, as they watch what they, what they did and, and looking at who they're going to play and all this kind of stuff. So when you tour the star, you see a bunch of different stuff. But when you walk into the film room, on the wall, there's only two words. And those two words are on the wall six times. Three times going up this way and three times going up the other wall. And those two words are this, the team. It says the team, the team, the team. And then on the other side it says the team. The team, the team. And as I was thinking about this, uh, I sat in that room and, and I was just kind of thinking about what I was going to say Sunday. And I said, man, that's, that's unity. You know why to me, I, they didn't say this and I didn't, Jason Garrett wasn't there to tell me this. But you know why I, I think it, it only has those two words up there, the team six times? I think that because egos don't win championships. 
Egos don't grow great churches. Egos don't transform a city. Egos have no room for God's agenda in their lives. A church that is unified in love, mission, and purpose is a church that will not be stopped. It will not be stopped. 1 Corinthians 1.10 says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there is no divisions among you, but that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. Perfectly united in mind and thought. Romans 12, 3 through 5 says, As God's messenger, I give each of you God's warning. Be honest in your estimate of yourselves, measuring your value by how much faith God has given you. Just as there are many parts to our bodies, so it is with Christ's body. We are all parts of it. We are all parts of it. And it takes every one of us to make it complete. For we each have different work to do. So we belong to each other and each needs all the others. Part of being unified. Part of loving the way that God wants us to love. The way that Jesus commanded us to love. Is reminding each other that we need one another. We need one another. We're all part of God's plan. We're all a part of his purpose for this church. We all play a part. You know who are the worst critics in in any church? The ones who are the worst critics are the ones who come in and all they do is consume. They're not serving. They're not ministering. They're not a part of the team. So they just come in here and they sit and they soak. And they're the ones that are the most critical and the most vocal. Why? Because they're not about the agenda of their church. They're just about their own agenda. And that's not loving. Unity means that we're all in. All of us. And we're focused. We're focused on Christ. We're focused on one another. And we're focused on sharing the gospel with the lost world. That's who we are as First Baptist Church Allen. And the last thing, number four, what does that love look like? Different kind of love. It's gospel driven. The whole point of who we are as a body of believers is to point people to Jesus Christ. Remember, I said we're relentlessly dedicated to reaching those outside of God's family with the gospel of Christ. The gospel is the only thing. It's the only thing that can heal brokenness. It's the only thing that can provide true peace. It's the only thing that can give true purpose. purpose. It's the only thing that can fix a broken world. And it's the only way to God. So why in the world would we point people anywhere else? To love, the way that Je- to love one another the way Jesus loved, the way that he told us that new commandment, love the way that he loved, that means that we're going to be gospel-centered. We're going to be about the message of Jesus Christ. Romans 1, 16 and 17 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written. Just as it is written. The righteous will live by faith. We're not going to hide what we do. As a church, we're not going to hide what we do. We're not going, we're not going to be, we're not going to be obnoxious about it. Okay? We're not going to be obnoxious about who we are, about what we believe, but we're not, we're not going to hide that we are who we are because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's going to be evident in all that we do and in all that we say. 1 Corinthians 1:18 says, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are being destroyed, but it is the power of God for those who are being saved. You see, here's the deal. When we, when we start loving the way that Jesus tells us to love, and he told us to love, okay, people are gonna, that's how we, they'll know that we belong to him, and people are going to notice that. People, people are going to notice, and they're going to, hey, what's going on with you? What's, go, what's going on with, at your church? What's going on with this the group of people that you, you talk about a lot, your community that you do life with. Well, what's going on with that? You see, because love is attractive. It's, it's people are hungry for it. People want to belong. And so when they ask why, we tell them why. We tell them because it's the, because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And here's, here's the thing. This verse tells us that some, some of them are going to, when we say, when we answer the question why, some of them are, are going to look at us and they're going to think we're foolish. They're going to think that's, that's dumb. But here's the other part. Some are going to look at that and some are going to be saved. 
In other words, some are going to go from an eternal, eternal destination separated from God forever to life everlasting with Jesus Christ, from darkness into light. They're going to change their residence from eternity, from eternity apart from God to an eternity with God. Why is that going to happen? That happens because of how we love one another. That's one of the ways it happens, is how we love one another, how we care for one another. And we are not going to hide the fact that we are a gospel-driven church. We love because that's how people we'll know we belong to Jesus and that's how we'll be able to share Jesus with others. This, being a jerk, closes doors. But being loving, it opens doors. Hebrews 3, 12 through 13 says, See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily as long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. You see, being gospel-driven means that we're willing to look out for one another. We're willing to look out for one another and lovingly, okay, if I could highlight that word, circle it, underline it, lovingly point out when we're getting off track. It also means that we're willing to let people speak into our lives when they see us getting off track. It's accountability. And we don't want, remember, we don't want anything to distract us from the mission of what God has called us to do. Coaches, they call out their players when their actions are hurting the team. Spouses, we'll we'll talk to one another when when we feel like the actions of the other is hurting the relationship. Bosses will call out their employees when their actions are compromising the business. Parents will talk to their kids when their actions are hurting the family or hurting themselves. And as a church, we want to make sure that as we do life together, that we're making sure that we are not distracting from the gospel, but lovingly encouraging one another to live out the gospel every day. You see, Jesus came into our brokenness to die for our sins. He was raised from the dead three days later. He offers us forgiveness and a new life if we'll surrender to him. And he did all of that because he loved us. That's the gospel. That's our message. That's our motivation for love. You see, when we love one another the way that Jesus called us to love one another, people will know that we belong to him. People will see that. They'll ask about it. They'll be attracted to it. And then they'll want to know why. And we can tell them why. We love because God loved us first. Last thing there, a church that transforms a city. It all starts with a church that loves each other well. What are we going to be known for? Are we bridge builders? Bridge builders to Jesus or are we stumbling blocks? Let's not... Be jerks. Let's love one another the way Jesus loved us. And when we do that, the world will take notice.